Well, as we begin this letter Paul wrote to the Colossians, uh, we've titled it A Letter From Then Till Now, because so much of what Paul's going to be writing about to this church in Colossae was really written to a group of people, maybe not unlike us. Um, Paul wrote it about 60 A.D., so, you know, we're estimating if you use A.D. as uh, after Jesus' death, then the idea is, you know, within 60, 70 years after Jesus had passed away and risen again. Um, It was a letter, interesting enough, that Paul had never been there. And yet he heard about some of the struggles that were going on with this new church, and he was so in love with what he'd heard, their story, and how they'd come about that he, uh, while he was in prison, he was under house arrest, he wrote a couple of letters, one to a church in a city called Ephesus, and one to a church in a city called Colossae. And as he wrote this letter to them, um, he knew some things that were happening in their midst. Now, I don't want to give a whole history lesson on Colossae. You, I think we have an old map of kind of what the old city was. It was, a, it was an interesting place in this that at its peak, it was a, a really well-known trade center, uh, academics, universities, uh, lots of lots and lots of money going in and out of it. Um, it also had a military base. It was just a really strategic place. Uh, it's located in what we would now say Turkey, and and so like it was thriving for years and years and, and generations. And then um, something happened. Well, two things happened. One is just the way things work trade routes began to shift, and all of a sudden, Colossae was no longer on this major east-west trade route, and so their economy collapsed. Secondly, in the midst of all that, there was a massive earthquake, which just devastated the city. And so here's a group of people who at one point in their life, everything was like in the zone, you know what I mean? You ever been there in your life? Like, it's just all working the way it should. You know, you're, you got a good job. You, you, you're getting a good paycheck. You're, you know, you wake up in the morning. Your, your wife says you're still sexy or your husband says you're still good looking or your, your kids obey you. Your dog doesn't pee on the carpet. You, you go, you have friends that actually are nice to you. You know what I'm saying? And just sometimes you just, it's that, what was that song in the 80s, Walking in Sunshine, whatever that was, you know? You just feel like that. And then I don't know what the heck happens except this thing called life, boom, right? And all of a sudden, like, things shift, and you're like, what is going on? And everything starts falling apart. And how many of you have been through the fall apart season in your life? Okay, so you're in the right church. Um, right, and so the, can you imagine? Well, you can't imagine because our generation has lived through it again, right? And in, in, in 2008, 9, 10, when, the, when our whole economy began to collapse and all these people are losing jobs and going in debt and all this stuff was happening and our, just the overall morale of our nation was decreasing, right? So it's not just your checking account. I'm just talking, there's just times in your life you feel like you're on top of the world and there's times that the whole world's on top of you. That's kind of what was happening in Colossae. And, but, you know, bad enough that economics were, were tanking, but then they had to have an earthquake. And, and so we find this shift occurs in their life. And, you know, maybe that's where you and I have been. Sometimes our own choices catch up with us. Sometimes because of the way we cut corners and compromise and, and do certain things, we stay ahead of the game for a while. But sooner or later, it just always comes back and bites you in the butt, doesn't it? Sooner or later, poor choices catch up with us. Other of us, maybe it wasn't choices we've personally made. Maybe it's choices that were made around us that we're paying the price for somebody else's sin. But we find that every once in a while. It just feels like things are just, the bottom is falling out. And so you can imagine that in your life. You can imagine it in a city's life. And and sooner or later, life gets your attention, doesn't it? Sooner or later, you realize... And if you haven't, I got a great promise for you, you will, that no matter how good you are at everything, you can't control anything. Maybe that's where 
Maybe the 12 steps start in Colossae. Maybe just somebody one day woke up and said, look, my life has become unmanageable. I don't care what I do. This, I, I just, I cannot control this anymore. I can't control my own outcomes. I can't control my own destiny. I, I just feel like it's falling apart. And maybe that's where they led into step two, right? Believing in a power greater than themselves and turning their life and will over it, over to that power. Believing that change was possible, that it could actually happen. See, God invades our space so often, not at the pinnacle of our lives, but at the bottom of it, at the darkest places of it. If you're in a dark place right now in your life, you're a perfect candidate for the grace of God. You were actually, life has set you up, not for defeat, but for victory. Amen? Amen? And so this is where they were. They were disillusioned and debt and discouraged, and, and we've all been there, and so I better start preaching the, the Bible. All right. So Colossians 1 says this, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. Again, Paul opens up with a familiar phrase, grace and peace to you. We've spent a lot of times in, in the sanctuary church trying to identify grace is so much more than unmerited favor, that the word grace in the Bible is active. It is God's empowering presence in your life that enables you to be who he's created you to be and do what he's called you to do. And Paul looks at this, this city and looks at the church in this city and knows they're in debt, discouraged, and disillusioned. And he says, grace to you from the Father. God is still going to empower you to be what he's created you to be and to do what he's called you to do. He opens the letter with that, and then he spends the, the, the rest of it telling them how that is possible. And so he says, we always thank God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all God's people. Again, he hadn't been there, but he had heard the stories. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored in you in heaven about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. So there had been a message that had been delivered to this group of people. It wasn't by Paul. And it wasn't by Timothy, but the message had changed the city. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. He's reminding them you're a part of a bigger picture, that God is at work. Don't, you know, you, we get this, like sometimes when we're struggling in our life, we just get really isolated, don't we? And we just, we, we don't look around at, at God's grace in other people's lives and we just think that something's wrong with us and we pull away. And so Paul's reminded them, man, God's at work all across this area. Just, just look around. You'll be encouraged. You know, believe in their belief until you get belief of your own, right? And then verse 7, you learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf who also told us of your love in the Spirit. Here's this guy, Epaphras. We only hear about him a couple times in, in the New Testament. Epaphras. You heard about this message from Epaphras. I, I don't know why. I, I'm sitting during worship this morning, and it just kept ringing in my head. You heard this message from Epaphras. This guy. I don't know what he looks like. We see drawings of Paul, you know, and ideas of who Paul was and Peter and Jesus. And there's this guy, Epaphras, who had a calling on his life. He just went to Colossae with a message. He just felt something in his destiny was sending him to this people. And he went there and began to change a city. So much so that, you know, Epaphras so loved these people, he went back to Paul. What most historians tell us is he journeyed all the way back to where Paul was in prison to tell them, Paul, I got this amazing group of people in Colossae. And, and they started off so well, but right now they're struggling. Right now they're, they're, they're falling back into old patterns. And 
old belief systems, and can, what do I do? And so, you know, it tells me a couple things. One is Epaphras was connected to, some, to something bigger than himself, right? He, he had been mentored most likely by Paul or Timothy. He, he, uh, he, he knew um, that he wasn't Paul, and Paul knew that Epaphras had his own unique calling and released him in that. He moved into unfamiliar territory with an unfamiliar message. Because something about the sovereignty of Christ in his life said, this is where I want you to go. And see, it's the message that changed the city. It wasn't the personality. It wasn't Epaphras or, you know, it wasn't like, well, if Paul doesn't go there, there's no way anybody's going to get saved. Right? There's no way somebody's going to change their life if it's not Paul or Timothy because they're the big dogs right now. But Epaphras was just a guy, a guy with a calling, and he stepped into an unfamiliar place, and he brought an unfamiliar message, and people grabbed hold of it, and their faith began to just explode through it, just doing what the Holy Spirit led him to do, share with others the good news of Jesus. Jesus changed my life, and I think he can change yours. My life was a mess and a wreck, and look what he did, and now I'm here just to tell you something. It's real. Step out of religion. Step out of all these other things, all these other things that you're trying to do to to get God's favor again because you already have God's favor. Step out of, you know, this, you know, there was all kinds of religious practices in Colossae and and Judaism was one of them, but many others. And, and, you know, maybe Epaphras just walked in there and said, I I don't know about all that stuff. I don't know about predestination and and post-tribulation. And I don't know about, you know, circumcision. All I know is Jesus grabbed hold of me and I am different. And he stepped into that city and he said, I think he can do the same for you. We don't need to dress Jesus up in religious clothes. He is freaking altogether attractive as he is. He's altogether compelling as he is. The message and the person of Christ is all we need to communicate. And so they overcame the enemy in Colossae with the blood of the lamb and the word of his testimony. I just can't help but think God is raising up some Epaphrases in our midst. I'm just sitting here this morning and I just, this thing is just bursting in me. That some of you are called. You got an unfamiliar place and you're bringing an unfamiliar message and God is telling you to, to do it, to trust him, to go. He doesn't care what your gender is. He doesn't qualify you by your gender. He doesn't qualify you by your credentials or your color or your cash supply. He doesn't qualify you by how tall or short you are or by how old or young you are. He, he, you know, you've heard that phrase, God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. Like, there's just some of you that this thing's been burning inside of you. God is, I mean, we got, listen, we got people sitting in our midst that are Epaphrases already. I mean, I'm looking at this family right here and the time that they spend in Lebanon, like going to a people with an unfamiliar message. We got uh, folks that are in India right now. We got uh, folks that spend time in Europe right now. But you don't go, you don't have to go across the ocean to be an Epaphras. Some of you, God is calling out because he wants to send you into unfamiliar places. Places where, you know, it could be the homeless or suburbia. It could be an education or politics or entertainment. God be calling you to those in addiction or those in normie life. He could be calling you, but you just got this sense inside of you. I I just, I got to go. I I feel a stirring. You know what I'm saying? But then, then see, you understand that there's something that works against that. There's a, there's a force that doesn't want you to listen. And so you begin to hear things like, well, no, you're not good enough. No, you know, Dr. E., and Andy, like those two got it together. 
All right, never mind. Dr. E, he has it together. You get this, you get this accusing voice, right? Well, you don't know enough yet. You're not good enough yet. You're not articulate enough yet. And see, that's, you know, anytime you start feeling like accusations, that comes straight from the pit of hell, doesn't it? If you're, if you're feeling like you're being accused of something, then you've got to understand that's not the Holy Spirit. Now, if you feel like you're being challenged to be trained in something, that might be the Holy Spirit, right? But so what we find is, is that God is calling some of us to, to bring this good news, an unfamiliar message to an unfamiliar people group. And, and I just want to challenge you to, to learn in your life to say yes. To just say yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Just say that with me. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Do you feel something in your spirit when you say yes, Lord? Uh, you know, here's the crazy thing. You actually can't say no, Lord. You can verbalize that, but that's a contradiction in terms. You can't have somebody who's Lord and then say no to him. Right? But when you say yes to him, you get yourself in alignment with him. And God begins to empower those things. And so God might call you across the planet or in your neighborhood or even to, you know, some of the most misunderstood people groups in the world who live in Texas. I, you know, you might just find yourself sent. So listen, success in the kingdom of God. Hang, hang with this one. Success in the kingdom of God is not about the outcome. It is about the obedience. When God calls you to something, you are not responsible for the outcome. You're responsible for the obedience. That's what makes you successful in the kingdom. Okay, man, I got to move. So, verse 9, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that, gives the, that the Spirit gives. I want to really hone in on this next three verses. So that you may live a life worthy So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. Bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. So that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people. Wow. You know, I, sometimes I wonder, are we living a life worthy of what Christ has done? Now, don't get me wrong here. You don't have to live a life worthy to get God to love you, right? He really does. I mean, I'm serious. You can sit on your ass for the next 50 years, and he's going he's gonna to love you. Or you could realize how much he loves you. Listen, you could realize how much he loves you and be compelled to tell others. Does that make sense? I mean, it just changes things. And so this is, you know, let me just give you, uh, I'm going to run through four things he says here. A kingdom life worth living. So many of us just live life by default, don't we? We just kind of go through life, things happen. Somebody tells us you should go to school, you go to school. Or somebody tells you you should get a job, you get a job. That job leads to this, that leads to that. And it's like we don't stop and just say, what, what am I created for? God, I want to live a life worthy of what you've done for me. I mean, I, I get it. I, I have friends in recovery who, who, because of the great depth that God had pulled them out of in their life, they just can't help but want to give that away to others. I know people who have come out of uh, suicide and depression and, and overarching anxiety in their life, and God has raised them out of that, and they just spill joy on everybody now. So there's something about living a life worthy of that. And the first thing that Paul says here, he says, look, verse 10, so you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work. So there's the first one. Just keep doing good. If you want to live a life worthy of what Jesus has done for you, then just be a do-gooder, right? 
Just do good. Even when you don't want to, even when you're just grumpy or, or you know, you're kind of just feeling selfish, just keep doing good. You are sowing into your life spiritual equity and maturity by learning just to do good even when you don't feel like doing good. Now, hear me again. I am not saying do good things to get God to love you. I am saying because God loves you so much, you have the capacity to do good even when you don't feel like it. God empowers that in our life. Remember the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control? What if our good deeds and our good things we were doing were just filled with that kind of fruit? What if we were just nice to people and it just showed kindness? What if we were nice to people and it showed self-control or, you know, when somebody's about to cut you off in in, in traffic and instead of accelerating, you do the really, really godly thing and slow down and let them merge, (laughs) especially if it's a black forerunner, okay? Um, But this is those ideas, you know, that's why Jesus, he talked about a farmer one time. He said, look, you know, it's like when you have seed and you you sow it the right way, you should be yielding 30, 60, 100 fold. Like God's given you certain things, now just do good with them. And and you're going to live a life worthy of that. And you find the more you sow into other people's fields, you start reaping in your own. Number two, he says, uh, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. Notice how he's trying to get the church of Colossae centered again, right? And so, you know, this next phrase really speaks of growing in the knowledge of God. Our problem in Western culture is we immediately think of going back to school right? Oh, I need to grow in the knowledge of God. I should go to seminary or I, you know, I should study more. I'm not saying you shouldn't read your Bible, but, but this word does not imply uh, academic knowledge. It implies intimate knowledge. Amen. It implies growing in the knowledge or deepening your relationship with Christ. Grow in your cooperative friendship with Jesus, not just your business relationship with him. You know, it's one thing when you feel free to tell God whatever you want. It's quite another when he trusts you enough to tell you what's on his heart, right? To just develop a cooperative friendship with Jesus. You know, the, it's, it's the idea of uh, such intimacy. Maybe it's, uh, it's a really similar equivalent to the word in, in the Old Testament when in Hebrew it says, uh, Adam knew Eve. It's that kind of intimacy. It's not like, well, Adam knew her. Yeah, I know her name and her, her eyes are blue and, you know, whatever. It's not just knowing surface level things, but like, have you ever had a friend or a spouse who, like, you could almost finish each other's sentences? You just kind of knew what they were thinking? Not finish their sentence so you can tell them what to do, but I'm just saying. <laughs> you just, like, there's that kind of connection, right? Isn't that amazing if you could walk around your school or your workplace or this community and, and just know in your knower, oh, this is what Father's doing today. I get it. God, you put this person in front of me not to be a nuisance, but so I can be a blessing. Right? So deepen your friendship with Christ. Um, and see, back when Paul wrote this letter, there were some folks who really valued knowledge but they valued it it almost too much. They were called Gnostics. You might have heard that phrase before. And Gnostics were people who were so intellectually studied and brilliant, they basically just looked down on everybody else because they they had the understanding of the mystery, you know? And so they treated everybody else as ignorant, basically. And so the idea was, if I could just learn enough, then I'll know God enough. And it wasn't that kind of learning, and so... Paul noticed that they were slipping back into that, that that Gnostic influence was growing again. See, I know so many people who have spent so much of their life just gaining knowledge of God, but it doesn't do them squat when their life falls apart. You get what I'm saying? If you don't translate knowledge to revelation, it's not going to sustain you. So when you learn something about God's character, when you learn something about God's love, then you apply that to its corresponding challenge in your life. 
So if you feel and wake up in the morning and the first thoughts going through your head is I am not lovable, I am unworthy, I am garbage, then that's when you take the knowledge of God. No, that's not true because the word tells me that how great is the love that God has lavished upon me that I'm a child of God. Now, I don't want to just know that in my head. I want to walk it out in my belief. He is not, I don't just think it up here. I feel it down here. Go like this if you're with me, right? All right, so it's relational knowledge. Number three, he says this, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might that you may have great endurance and patience. It's a long phrase that Paul is basically saying to you and I, endure and persevere, but not on your own strength, but on the strength that God gives you, right? The word uh, in here that really translates in terms of endurance is uh, this, in, in original Greek, it really means to be underneath something for a long time, right? To like have the weight of something just continually pressing down on you. And how many of you have gone through a season in your life, you just feel like the weight of a, an issue has just not left? You know what I'm saying? And you just, your shoulders get tired, your body gets tired, you don't sleep well at night. Things like that start to happen. And Paul's saying, look, I get it. As a matter of fact, he continues with that idea. And, um, you know, he's not just saying endurance, but perseverance. And perseverance is, is in the Greek, it's this... Um, Long suffering. Not just long suffering, which is the way we usually say it. It's just long suffering. Now you hear long suffering right now and some of you are immediately thinking about a person that you have suffered long with the pain that this person has caused you some of you are not thinking about a person some of you are thinking about a circumstance something that has been plaguing you in your life it could be debt that you've incurred it could be uh you know, anything around your life that is just, you've been waiting and waiting and suffering because of it. Some of you aren't thinking about a person or a circumstance, you're thinking about a part of your body. And you've been suffering for a long time. And maybe somebody you love, their body. And you've prayed and you've prayed and you've endured and there's still pain. There's still struggle. Some of you aren't thinking about a person or a circumstance or a part of a body. Some of you are thinking about a chemical or an image or a substance. You're thinking about an addiction where you have suffered long. You've been white knuckling it for 30 days or 90 days or three years. I don't know. And you know what? They're all right. But Paul, you know, listen, the Holy Spirit wouldn't put things in the Word if we didn't need to hear them. Yeah, come on. Right? And so, for some reason, He knows our human condition that we will need to endure and persevere in our lives. Because there are times that it just is hard. And what Paul says here is that perseverance and endurance will yield something glorious in your life. You know, Charles Spurgeon once said that it was by perseverance and patience that even the snail made it to the ark. I mean, I, you ever wonder, like, what a head start that those two guys had to get, right? Like the cheetahs. They got the telegram like maybe three hours before. And like the snails probably got the telegram, hey, there's going to be a flood. And it was like three years before it even started, you know. But they made it, right? 
But this idea in our lives that, you know, the Holy Spirit puts this in there because he knows. But the, but the key that Paul's trying to say is if you try to persevere and you try to long suffer in your own strength, at some point you may actually collapse under it. You may lose your faith. You may, you may just fall victim to it again. But if you tap into the mighty power of God, if you understand God's grace in your life, his empowering presence that enables you to be who he's created you to be and do what he's called you to do, then you have an endless supply of the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. You can suffer and persevere and that's why, you know, Paul wrote this in Corinthians. He says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair because you are being renewed day by day. Or in the modern Celebrate Recovery translation, you are being renewed one day at a time, one step at a time. And finally, he says this, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have the great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. One of the best ways to live a life worthy of what Jesus has done, a kingdom life, is just to walk with an attitude of gratitude. Amen. Just be thankful for what's around you. We don't always have to focus on what's wrong. Just have gratitude. Now listen, I have the Holy Spirit in my life, and then I have Cindy in my life. And sometimes they're synonymous. That means the same. So last night, yesterday, I was kind of just whining. It's Labor Day weekend. I'm seeing all these beautiful trailers go up Highway 24 and all these beautiful motorcycles buzzing around Mantu Springs and, and people getting these four-day weekends. And I'm like, I have to work this weekend. I just, man, I, I want a vacation, you know? I, you know, I want to just go and just chill out or whatever. And, you know, I, was, I think I was just kind of down because of John Park's situation and whatever. And, and then she's like, yeah, I get it. Oh, didn't you just get back from Europe? Didn't God give you a chance to go to Ireland this year, South Africa a couple years ago, and Nepal and India? And I'm like, okay, okay, I'm getting it, right? She was just shifting my perspective back to an attitude of gratitude. Like we chose a certain kind of life. We really did. But that life has a cost, but it also has incredible blessing. The people we've met and the places we've been and, and serving, and, and it just, uh, you know, so I repented. Anyway, so, but you know, Paul, Paul basically says this, let me finish here. If you need a little help with your attitude of gratitude, just read those next couple of verses. He's rescued you from the dominion of darkness. Think about where you once were and where you are now. He brought you into the kingdom of light. God didn't just bring you out of darkness. He's inviting you somewhere else. He doesn't just bring you out of your trouble and leave you. He moves you from bondage to freedom to promise. And if nothing else, in Christ we have the forgiveness of sins. You can walk through this world with a guilt-free conscience because of what Jesus has done. That alone should stir up some gratitude. And Paul, for the rest of this letter, just focuses back on Christ and Christ alone. Amen? Let's stand. Mm. God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you 
that you invite us from bondage to freedom to promise. May we just live a life worthy of what you've uh, done for us. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to a message from the Sanctuary Church. For more information and media, go to our website at thesanctuarywestside.org or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube.